Then he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars, according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he threw against the altar, and then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, that I may give you the tablets of stone with the law and commandments, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses rose with his assistant, Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we return to you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain forty days and forty nights. Thus ends the reading of God's word. What do you do if you want a relationship to become closer? Let's take three circumstances at the same time. Uh, A constituent and his congressman, a salesperson and a potential client, and a man and a woman. Well, the relationship starts off distant. That's why you want it to grow closer. Um, And if you can't bridge the distance initially between you, you might need someone else to do it. You might call the congressman's secretary. Can I set up a meeting? You might ask a, a known client that you have for a referral to get in contact with a new client. Or with the girl you like, you might whisper to her friend, I like your friend. Can you introduce me? Next, you, you need to make some sort of statement about what your intentions are and who you are. A constituent might say, I need help with a problem and only you can solve it. Or I, I want to warn you of a danger, Congressman. Or a salesman might say, boy, do I have a deal for you. Or if a suitor, I... I have something that you left. I must return it to you. Or I have a gift that I can only give you in person. Perhaps it's a poem praising her or introducing yourself as a very eligible bachelor that she should notice. Next, we need a response from the congressman, client, or lady. We need a little proceed, do tell. It's a little uh, little bit of, I like what I'm hearing, go on. I will hear more from you on this matter. And then, then comes the actual meeting. You, you want the relationship to grow, to deepen. And so the very meeting is itself the relationship growing, deepening. 
And so you schedule a time to sit down together or maybe even have a drink together or if things are going really well, a meal. And then if that goes well, you might get the congressman to sign on the dotted line to oppose the bill or you might get the client to sign on the dotted line for a trade-in deal or you might get the girl to promise to say yes at a future date. The point is, relationship depth is ratified by commitment. And there is a certain ceremony, there is a liturgy, there is a process to this deepening. All these human relationships point to how a person's relationship with God deepens. There's a bit of ceremony and liturgy also with the God of the Old and New Testament. And here in Exodus 34, we see this deepening relationship between God and his people spelled out for us. And there are lessons to be learned for us even here so far from this uh, epoch of church history. We're going to see the very official way to begin a relationship with God and to renew a relationship with God. For a sinner to draw near to a holy God requires a covenant renewal ceremony. For a sinner to draw near to a holy God requires a covenant renewal ceremony. Point number one, a covenant confirmation requires representation. Verse two, representation, someone representing you. God is so holy that the people cannot approach themselves. Did you see that? And even the elders who are of like substance with the people cannot approach. It would be as if you were a snowman trying to approach a fiery furnace. You can't do it. God is this fire on the mountain. But Moses can approach. Why? Because God has chosen him to represent. He is that representation. God's people needed a mediator. You need a mediator between you and God, someone to stand in between. If you think that you can just pray, to a holy, holy, holy God coming to, into his presence with your own purity of spirit. Your, your own conscience will accuse you that something isn't right. Even one of the most holy men to ever walk the earth, Job, said, I need a mediator. I need someone to stand between. And now, I'm not saying that you need a priest to confess your sins. Priests are sinners too. You need a representative. And now neither Mary nor the saints have been chosen to be the covenant representative as if they had any sort of merit to, to grant you. They are sinners like yourselves, only history and myth making them anything more. Jesus is the only mediator. 1 Timothy 2.5. So in order to come to God, you must come through Jesus, your representative. And God has always worked in his relations with people by using a representative. This should be no surprise to you to hear me speak in this way. What's the application? Well, the application is that this has implications for working with other religions. Oftentimes, the world looks at religions as basically the same. We're called people of faith. And so sometimes there's a desire to work in an ecumenical fashion. That means Muslims, Jews, Christians, Buddhists, all having a prayer service together or advocating for mental health together. But the holiness of God and the necessity of a singular mediator impinges upon these efforts. We can be cordial and gracious to people of other faiths, but we cannot be naive and think that prayers apart from those done in Jesus' name, or ever heard and honored. Search the scriptures. Listen, even husbands who hate their wives, their, their, their prayers are not heard. See Malachi 2. Point number two, a covenant confirmation involves declaration. Declaration. Look at verses 3 and 7. The Lord declared himself to Moses. Then Moses declared all the words to God's people. You know what this sounds like? This sounds like a covenant. It sounds like like a good covenant. 
an honest covenant. You say, of course, but oh, that all covenants were so. Have you seen the names on some of the bills that Congress passes? They're the precise opposite of what is embedded in the bill. Or even the summary on some of the things that they ask us to vote is actually a meandering farce compared to what's actually in it. On the other hand, you have declared what is true here in an honest way. Have you ever said yes to something before you knew what you're saying yes to? One time, a young lady said, was getting ready to ask me a question, and I said, whatever it is, yes. And you know what? It was fine. She didn't know how to take advantage of me and, and my ignorance in that moment, and she was asking for something small. I got very lucky. The person who I was dealing with didn't know how to take advantage of my momentary lunacy, but, but the point is good agreements involve upfront declarations of what they intend. Moses reads, as it were, the title page, the summary of God's laws, and the people listen. God's word needs to be placed authoritatively before you, honestly, truthfully. And too often, what popular preachers are doing, what evangelical preachers are doing, is saying, this text, you see what it says? It actually means quite the opposite. That is not declaring to you the word of God. And notice how God sovereignly covenants with his people. It's not a two-way street. The people don't get to propose amendments. They don't get to line item veto. I like this, but I don't like this. They don't get even to clarify. This was God's initiation. An application, you need to listen to the preaching of the word. Otherwise, it is naive or dishonest for you to say that you follow God or you will follow God without listening to what his word says. How do you know what you're signing up for? Number three, a covenant confirmation involves affirmation. Verses three and seven, affirmation, saying yes, I affirm. The people said, we will do, we will obey. What is your response to the moral law? If the moral law were to be put before you, what would you say? If you're not ready to say, this is good, I submit to it, you're not ready to go deeper in your relationship with God. You need to mentally, verbally, and publicly Interact with God's law in order to enter into a relationship with him. Yes, this is good. And it's appropriate to consider the stipulations of a deal before you proceed. What are you signing up for? It's important uh, for suitors and the engaged to count the cost of a marriage and really say yes to it. I, I know a man who questioned that sickness and health line. He said, I know that... We, you have to say, I'll be with you in sickness and health, but sickness, though, it's really sick. Do we really have to? Yes, this is the covenant. And we affirm a covenant with God by saying yes to it. But, but can we keep it, though? The Israelites said, we will do it. Did they? Well, there was a young lady in my household who, when we would tell her that she really needs to do something, she would say, I won't. I won't. And what she meant was, I will, but somehow the end got on the end there. But it was honest. It was a very honest answer. I kind of want to, but I'm, I'm not gonna later. Uh... And that kind of is a, a perfect example of our response to God's word and God's law. We should say, yes. It is right and good for us to say, I will, I want to. But it's also honest for us to say that we struggle to obey this. 
God initiated this covenant with sinful people. Did you notice some of you Bible scholars, some of the names in this secret story of Scripture? Nadab and Abihu, you remember them? They have a very sad story later. And yet even those two, the Lord was covenanting with. He didn't say, not you two. You guys can just go off into the desert. He knows that you are sinful people, yet he covenants with you. What is your response to his covenant? One of the pastor's most frequent emails that I've found is three words. This is good from Pastor Sharping. This is good. And yet it is an important and good thing to say. And that's the question before you. You're getting this message from the Lord. Can you say, this is good? Or do you hate it so much or do you love your sin so much that you can't even bring yourself to say that? Number four, covenant confirmation requires expiation. Look at verses 4 through 6, and then verse 8. Blood. Expiation is a covering for sin. Blood must be shed in order for sinners to enter into the presence of a holy one such as the Lord God. Again, this is no surprise to you. You've seen this in the stories of Adam. An animal the skins whereof were clothed them, was killed. Abel gave a life. Noah sacrificed animals that he just saved. Abram passed between the separated bodies of an animal. Blood must be shed in order to enter into covenant with this Lord God. He's the same Lord God. And a proper altar for sacrifice needed to be built, presumably uncut stone. But somehow, I think Moses was able to set it up. And this story happens uh, before the priestly system had been set up, and so they merely used young men. That's what it says. Uh, you need young men who could be strong enough to kill a bull, uh, wrestle it, offer it as a sacrifice, prepare it. And the blood of the covenant needed to be applied to the people. You may have grown so used to Pastor Barker's lines that he says before you as we baptize a child, but do you remember what he says? It's not so much um, people being applied to water, but water being applied to the people. The blood is applied to the people here. The sign is applied to them, symbolizing covering in death. In order for you to enter into a relationship with God, you must never forget that a blood sacrifice had to be made. Old Testament, New Testament. And that reveals the serious, deadly holiness of the God you serve. So holy. So angry. So full of wrath at sin. And it reveals the terrible sadness of your sinful estate. Remember, in our corporate prayer we're looking at the cross and seeing how the depths of our sin <clears throat> and so in application christian unite yourself to christ in his death by dying to sin in christianity you're not killing any living thing you're not called to you're not called to cut apart part of yourself in christianity but you are called to be killing sin and cutting it off from your life and laying hold of the propitiation made in Christ. That is the total undoing, the total wiping away of your sin. Number five, a covenant confirmation involves consummation. Consuming something. Eating, drinking. As if to ratify this new covenant agreement, the Lord hosts a meal on the mountain. Those sacrifices that were done could have been wholly burnt up. This is something that happened often in ancient times, but here they're not. They're not wholly burnt up. They're they're grilled to perfection, and the ancient elders dined and drank with the Lord. And they seem to be partly or somehow in the Lord's presence. The, The only thing that's mentioned here is the stone under his feet. So 
if they're still somewhat removed from the Lord, it makes more sense in light of uh, the later chapters where the Lord only allows Moses to see his back as he hides Moses in the cleft of the rock. So perhaps the, the elders were dining with the Lord, but he was over and above them, separated by this sapphire paving stone. It's strange that this part of the story is so often left out of children's Bibles and Bible summaries, but this is an important aspect to the covenant ceremony. Why? Because this feast reveals that the Lord doesn't just want to lecture his people. Let me give you some rules from on high. These laws are given in the context of intimate table fellowship. He cares for you. He wants you to be one of the people at his table. And that a covenant involves consuming food and drink connects what the Lord was doing with Moses and what the Lord was doing with his people in the interaction of the Holy, uh, the, the Lord's Supper. This meal is a key aspect of covenant interaction with the Holy Lord. And deepening your relationship with the Lord means looking forward to his table, examining yourself as you prepare to come to his table, delighting that you are called to sup at his table. Point number six, a covenant confirmation involves inscription. Inscription, verse 12, inscribing something, writing something. I know that you know this about the Ten Commandments already, but God wrote them. God wrote something on stone for his people's instruction. He literally wrote them. God's writing was once for all. And the scholars believe that the reason there were two tablets of stone is not because all the words didn't fit on one tablet, uh, but because, like other ancient Hittite treaties, the whole law would be written on one tablet for the king, and the whole law would be written on a second tablet for the vassal. The law binds both parties together. The Lord also wrote this on stone because it's important, it's permanent. There's no cut and paste feature on stone. There's no shadow banning on stone tablets. The Lord wants his instruction to be clear and perennial. And guess what else is part of stone is you got to be brief. We're not writing any novels on stone. That's a beautiful thing about God's law is that it is brief, it is clear, it is to the point. The Lord wants his instruction to be clear and perennial. And if God had wanted his Sabbath command to expire with the state of Israel, he wouldn't have put it on stone tablets. God wrote once, but were to repeatedly read. The application for us is to see the succinct beauty of the Ten Commandments and read them over and over and over again. Why? Because they're still binding. Why? Because they're life-giving. Why? Because without them, we can pretend to be good on our own, but with the law, our pretense is removed. We're cut to the quick, and we realize we need a sacrifice for all the ways in which we fall short of this law. So don't be afraid to read the hard commandments. Don't ignore them thinking they're dusty old heirlooms. The Word of God is living and active. Well, How does this apply to us as New Testament believers? How does this apply to you if you are not yet a believer? Jesus, during his three-year ministry, declared what he was about. He interpreted God's law in the Sermon on the Mount, and he expected a response. A ritual washing and acknowledgement of sin. A physical sign to represent repentance and acquiescence to Jesus' message. An affirmation. So, if you have not already, repent and be baptized in response to Jesus. Say, I am a sinner in need of saving. And with that affirmation, we're not saying, I'll completely keep Jesus' law. No, our our affirmation is, the law is good. I am not. I cast myself on God's mercy. 
And Jesus invited his disciples to consummate the covenant with him over a covenant meal, which we now call the Last Supper. He now invites all those who repent and believe to join him repeatedly to renew the covenant vows and remember his death for you. His death on the cross was the expiation of the new covenant. The new covenant still requires a blood sacrifice to draw near to God. But Jesus, our sole representative and our sole sacrifice, paid the price for our sins to be covered, yea, removed. Expiation isn't big enough, isn't great enough. It's propitiation. Totally undoing our sins and giving us instead the righteousness of Christ. Jesus' death and resurrection were so powerful that our sins are utterly wiped away. Well then, what's the inscription of the new covenant? Well here, Hebrews 8.10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people And Hebrews 10, 16, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. So allow God to inscribe his loving law on your hating heart and utilize the covenant renewal ceremony of the Lord's Supper to remind you that your salvation was at God's gracious initiation. Let's pray.